Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the show today. I'm super excited to have a cost segregation expert on with us today, Frank. Frank, thanks for being here. Hey, hey how are you, Sujata? I'm doing great, thank you. So everyone, Frank Judici is a civil engineer by degree. He spent 15 years in the construction management industry, working for two top ranked builders with project experience ranging from high rise luxury apartment buildings to nanotech manufacturing facilities. Now, Frank is business development director on the, in the cost segregation industry, helping to set the record straight. Awesome, well, we're so excited to learn about cost segregation today, Frank. So why don't you start by uh, giving us a little bit of color about how you got into this industry and then diving into what is cost segregation? Perfect. So, you know, Suja, as, as you already know, I, I stumbled into this industry after really just needing to get out of uh, the construction management industry and, and having, you know, property of my own and, and, and at being at a real estate conference and bumping into somebody starting to talk about, he introduced cost segregation to me. I had no idea what he was talking about. Uh, and quite honestly, I, I actually felt like he was pulling my leg. I didn't think it was, it was, it would sounded too good to be true. Um, and, and I, and I actually, I went home, started researching it, found out it was completely legit. Uh, it's an IRS approved strategy to accelerate, you know, depreciation deductions on commercial real estate. Um, and so I basically got my start in the industry working part time. Um, and uh, unfortunately, you know, I ended up finding out that the person I decided to start my cost segregation career with uh, was not uh, on the up and up and was a little bit of a con artist. Uh, and that's, that was a real eye opener to me. And, and quite honestly, it's, it's the reason why I'm on this national podcast campaign to set the record straight. So it, it, it was that that really taught me a valuable lesson that not all cost segregation providers were created equal. And so I really had to like sit back and, and do my own due diligence and determine, you know, what company I wanted to work for and represent and, and had to make sure that they were on the up and up and they were legitimate and they had a great reputation with the IRS and so on and so forth. So I landed on, on Bedford um, and uh, my, my time with Bedford, I've, I've seen a lot of the competition. I've seen their studies. I've, I've seen how they work and uh, the, the quality of people that they're using to produce these studies uh, and it's scary. It really is scary. So in any case, that's kind of, I just really stumbled into the industry, but I absolutely love the value add that I'm able to bring to general partners and, and limited partners and just investors, developers in general. Um, it's, it's just a fantastic tool to, to generate tax savings so that you can take advantage of the time value of money. That's the key. Awesome. So let's just dive into that concept, you know, really quick. When you said you found out about cost segregation and thought it was too good to be true. <laughs> For our listeners who are maybe newer to, you know, real estate and syndications and what 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 was that about? Yeah, so so you know, obviously, well, I shouldn't say obviously, because there's, you know, I wasn't aware in the beginning either, but when you own commercial real estate, and please take note, when I say commercial real estate, I mean um, residential use and commercial use. As long as it's an income producing property, it's considered commercial real estate. So when you own commercial real estate, there's a depreciable basis that's assigned to all commercial real estate. So if you buy a piece of real estate, it's the purchase price minus the land value, and that's what gives you the depreciable basis. If you build a property brand new, then it's all the hard and soft costs added together equal your depreciable basis. So when I say depreciable basis, you know, that's that's what I'm referring to. This is the, the, the dollar value of your building that the IRS forces you to depreciate on an annual basis. Um, and that's a good thing, right? Because when you depreciate something that counts as a deduction to your taxes. So depreciation is a good thing. Depreciation allows you to use a deduction, offset income, and voila, you've got tax savings, okay? So now where does cost segregation come into play? So cost segregation is an engineered study that's generated on any and all types of commercial real estate 
And what it does is it justifies to the IRS that you're able to take a larger deduction in the current year than what you would typically do had you not performed cost segregation. So now let me go back to some basics. The IRS mandates that all commercial use commercial real estate depreciates over 39 years, okay? So uh, that's, that's a given. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. 39 years for commercial use commercial real estate. If it's residential use uh, uh, commercial real estate, like state depreciates over 27 and a half years. So the way that your annual depreciation deduction is calculated by your CPA, and it gets a little more complex, but the bottom line is you're going to take the depreciation and you're going to divide it by 27 and a half or 39 years. The number is that'll be your annual depreciation deduction for as long as you own that property. The problem is when you depreciate, when you divide something by 27 and a half or 39 years, it only equates to two to three percent of an annual depreciation deduction. So it's just not much. Okay. And so a lot of times when you own commercial real estate, you generally need more deductions to be able to offset the, the, the taxable income that that property is generating. Otherwise, you're paying that you're always trying to play is how can you increase your deductions to be able to offset your income so that you're not paying taxes. That's the ultimate goal. And so cost segregation allows for that goal to be achieved. What we do is we, we segregate, right, i.e. cost segregation, we segregate assets from the, from the property that have a shorter depreciable life than 27 and a half or 39 years. We segregate two things in a cost seg study. We segregate personal property, which, which depreciates over five years or seven years, and we segregate land improvements. Land improvements depreciate over 15 years. So now step back and think about that. If you have the option to take a piece of property and depreciate anywhere from 10% to 50% of the total value over five, seven, and 15 years, as opposed to 27 and a half or 39, that's a big benefit, okay? So that's the nature of cost segregation. It's a mechanism that allows people to accelerate their depreciation deductions to the current year so that they have more deductions now to offset income and therefore you're taking advantage of the time value of money. That's what this is. This is a strategy that allows people to take advantage of the time value of money. Okay, awesome. Thanks so much for taking some time to explain it. And just for folks who are not as familiar with the terminology, can you provide some examples of what would be personal property and what would be land improvements? Great question. So let's talk about a, let's just talk about a simple multifamily property. So um, a multifamily property that has its own driveway or its own parking lot, it has off street parking. Okay. So examples of land improvements, 15 year assets, land improvements are anything that's exterior of the building shell. So that means stuff like landscaping, pavement, asphalt, concrete sidewalks, curbing, um, parking lot signage, parking lot striping, uh, signage, um, uh, uh, you know, patios, you know, brick patios, any sort of hardscaping, um, rock walls, retaining walls. There's some caveats when I say retaining walls. Decorative, decorative retaining walls are allowed, but actual structural retaining walls are not allowed. Um, so uh, stormwater drainage, um, you know, so, so there's, a, there's a whole plethora of, of 15 year assets, right? Think about any given multifamily, the entire parking lot, the sidewalks, the, the landscaping, the grass, the, the, the hardscaping patio, fences, um, if there is stormwater drainage in the parking lot. So all of that adds up. And so part of a cost seg study is to basically justify a value associated with all those various land improvement assets and pull that out of the 27 and a half year bucket and stick it into a 15 year bucket. So that's, that's, that's called land improvements. 
Now, personal property, which is five and seven year assets, personal property is anything that's actually attached to the building or within the building, generally. Um, so now let's go through a typical multifamily. So uh, uh, personal, personal property, any sort of resilient flooring, if it's luxury vinyl tile, luxury vinyl plank, uh, carpeting, um, you know, uh, linoleum, um, VCT tile, uh, anything like that, that type of flooring is considered personal property. Um, kitchen countertops, um, um, kitchen cabinets, all your appliances, um, the base, you know, the, the, the base trim that runs along the floor that, that covers up the junction between the floor and the wall, all base trim is considered a personal property. Um, and then the biggest is actually the electrical system. So usually about 25% of the value of the electrical system of a multifamily property is able to be justified as personal property. So think about this. You have a bunch of outlets that are that are inside every unit of a multifamily, right? Now, some outlets are deemed necessary for the overall operation and maintenance of the unit. However, a lot of times there are a lot more outlets in a room that are that are than are necessary. Okay, so those extra outlets can actually be written off as five-year personal property. Um, and, and, you know, outlets that are at waste level or higher, those are considered, you know, courtesy outlets. So those outlets are typically, you know, at, behind, you know, above the backsplash of kitchens. And that's usually to plug in a piece of personal property, right? A blender, a coffee maker, whatever it, whatever it is. But all the power that, that, that is utilized for personal property, you get to now segregate as, fi as a five-year asset. So, so that's, that's just a couple of examples of the five year and 15 year that are inherent with pretty much every multifamily property that, that exists out there. Okay, awesome. And I know that you touched on this already, uh, which is how cost segregation helps real estate owners. Uh, for those of our listeners who, you know, are still getting familiar with the concept of time value of money and why that matters, can you just sort of provide a little bit more color as to how, you know, why depreciating upfront is, is beneficial economically? Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, I, I would, I would hope that most people understand the time value of money concept. Obviously a dollar today is worth more than a dollar, um, you know, five, 10, 15, 20, 39 years from now. So, you know, typically investors, developers, um, you know, real estate folks, they want to free up as much liquid cash as possible every year because they know they want to invest that cash as soon as possible because the longer, the longer they go without investing their money into real estate, the real estate's just going to continue to skyrocket up. So, you know, the whole point is how do you generate liquid cash? And one of the ways to generate liquid cash is to not pay taxes, right? Because everybody, as you know, you're always, you know, forecasting how much taxes am I going to owe? And I need to make sure I have that in my piggy bank to cut that check to the IRS at the end of the year. So cost segregation is a great mechanism that allows you to front load depreciation deductions on real estate. And you can now utilize those deductions to offset your taxable income and now, if you can reduce your taxable income down to zero, you're paying Uncle Sam zero dollars in taxes. So that is a mechanism to save you from having to cut a check from your liquid funds. And now all of a sudden, you have money that was in your piggy bank that you had set aside to pay the IRS. And you can now put that money into the down payment of a piece of real estate, right? So that's, that's the nature of cost segregation. Now, I do want to be very upfront, though, Suja. We're not getting people any more depreciation than what their CPA allocates to them in the very beginning. So if you buy a building, Suja, for a million dollars, general rule of thumb, you throw 20% at land, land value. So you're left with a million less 200,000. You're left with an $800,000 depreciable basis. The basis is the basis. Sure. Cost sake providers like Bedford aren't going to get you any more or less depreciable basis. It is what it is, but what we can help you with 
is we can help you collect on that $800,000 deduction sooner than later. And so again, going, going full circle, anytime we can generate more money now, there's a, there's, a, there's a net present value associated with the dollar now versus later. So okay. that's, well, that's how it works. Great. I really like how you explain that, Frank. Now, can you talk about the changes in the tax code that's happened in the past few years and if you, what you might foresee going forward? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, we're all well aware we've had it, you know, pounded into our heads for the past four years now, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Okay. And when President Trump passed the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in December of 2017, there were some monumental um, uh, uh, changes that allowed for massive opportunity for real estate investors. So, um, You'll hear you'll hear the the you know the the buzzword bonus depreciation 100% bonus. So before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was passed, bonus depreciation was enacted in the early 2000s, and it was a way to help stimulate the economy. And bonus depreciation was intended for people who were building new buildings, developing new buildings, or renovating existing buildings. The whole point was to put hard hats to work to help stimulate the economy. So the first test that you had to pass to be able to claim bonus depreciation was it had to be new construction or renovations or improvements to existing properties. And that was from the early 2000s all the way up to, well, technically September 27th, 2017. You're gonna hear me say that a lot. September 27th, 2017, bonus depreciation, okay? When the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was passed, President Trump changed the rule, number one, to bonus depreciation. You didn't have to build it new and you didn't have to improve or renovate existing property. You could simply acquire. He allowed for the acquisition of real estate to be eligible for bonus depreciation. So that was a huge game changer. So now anybody who signed a purchase and sale agreement to acquire real estate as of September 28th, 2017 and forward to December 31st, 2022, you're allowed to claim bonus depreciation. What a beautiful thing. Now you're probably asking yourself, yeah, it sounds beautiful, but what's bonus? What's bonus depreciation? And it's a little bit of a deceiving term bonus because it makes you think that you're going to get more than your original depreciable basis. Not the case. You're still stuck with that original depreciable basis, $800,000, like my example. However, what bonus is, is you're allowed to claim a certain percentage of the full value of any assets in your building that have a class life of 20 years or less, you're able to claim a certain percentage of, that, of the full value of those assets in year one. So I'm a big example guy. I like to learn by example. And I like to teach by example. So let's go back to that $1 million property that you bought, Suja, and, and you, you, you turned into an Airbnb palace, okay? So you bought it for a $1 million. You allocated 20% to land. So you're left with an $800,000 depreciable basis, okay? Now, you bought that property in that time frame that I talked to you about. The purchase and sale agreement for that property was dated anywhere between September 28th, 2017 to present day. So boom, you, 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 you passed the first hurdle. You, you, you acquired the real estate and you acquired it within that given time frame, okay? So now, and I guess I should, I should back up. So not only did President Trump say that acquired real estate during that time frame was eligible for bonus depreciation, he also doubled the percentage of the bonus depreciation. So prior to December, prior to September 20, 28, 2017, bonus depreciation was set at 50%. He doubled it. He made it 100%. So Flipping back to the example, million dollar purchase price, $800,000 depreciable basis, acquired after September 27th, 2017. Um, 
and you have a cost segregation. Well, actually, you're considering having a cost segregation study done on it, right? But you really want to you really want to take advantage of 100% bonus, right? Because you get to claim 100% of the total value of all assets that have a 20 that have a 20 year class life or less, and that would be a really nice boost for you. Okay, so without cost segregation, what are you going to be able to claim? as 20 years or less. Because remember, you bought an Airbnb, which is used for, you know, uh, uh, it's used for residential purposes. However, I will say that you do have to be careful with Airbnb properties because a lot of times they're considered commercial use. They're basically considered like a hotel. It, you, you, if you had long-term renters, you could justify multifamily. But a lot of times Airbnb end up being 39 year commercial use, commercial real estate. Keep that in mind. So right now, that Airbnb is considered commercial real estate at 39 years. Well, 39 years is greater than 20 years. So you're scratching your head. You're going, how can I claim bonus depreciation? Yeah, I acquired the real estate, which makes me eligible. But the second test that you have to pass is you can only claim bonus depreciation on assets that are 20 years or less. And you're saying to yourself, I don't know. I bought a 39-year asset, so I guess I can't claim bonus. False. This is where cost segregation comes into play. Because as I stated earlier, a cost segregation study segregates typically three things. 15, seven, five-year property. Land improvements, personal property. Five, seven, 15-year assets. Well, five, seven, 15-year assets are all 20 years or less. So now all of a sudden you're back in the game. You can claim 100% bonus depreciation on those three assets. So now, again, $800,000 depreciable basis. It's, a, it's an Airbnb property. Uh, I'm going to say 20%. You're going to get a 20% cost segregation yield. So 20% of that $800,000 or $160,000, right? 20% of $800,000. you are going to be able to claim 20% of that $800,000 in year one because of bonus depreciation. So you're going to literally be able to have a $160,000 depreciation deduction in year one that you acquire that piece of real estate. So again, it's a real, real game changer. Now, if, if you weren't eligible for bonus for bonus depreciation, it may still make sense to do cost segregation because you're still going to segregate five, seven, and 15 year assets. So claiming $160,000 over five, seven, 15 years is a lot better than claiming it over 39. So it's not, you know, bonus depreciation, like I tell people, bonus, right? It's, it's a bonus. It's in addition to. So, um, you know, it, this is why you have a cost seg estimate performed. You want to make sure your estimate is done conservatively. You don't want somebody to go in, you know, too optimistic and then they're not able to meet the numbers that they told you about. And had you known it was going to come out to be that result, you would have never done the study. So you just need to make sure you're working with a, a, a provider that's going to, that's going to do what's in your best interest in, in producing use a conservative cost segregation estimate for you to make a, 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 an educated decision. Awesome. Thanks so much, Frank, for that uh, great example. Um, you actually happened to hit it right on the nail. I actually did buy a building for a million dollars that I turned into an Airbnb in 2018. Somehow you got that <laughs> right on the nose. <laughs> well, well, well so, so listen, so something to keep in mind, and this is one of the biggest misnomers in, in our industry, is that you can still, Suja, take advantage of cost segregation and bonus. So a lot of people think that if you don't do cost segregation in the first year that you buy it, it negates you from performing cost seg. That's completely false. The IRS allows people to do cost segregation studies as far back as 15 to 20 years. So you could, you could call me 14, 13 years from now and you could still catch up on the 100% bonus depreciation you didn't claim in 2018, you could catch it up in you know 2035 and, and it may still make sense, right? So just keep in mind, folks, this is something that is retroactive. The IRS allows you to catch up what you missed out on getting from when you first put it into service. 
and you don't have to amend your previous year's tax returns. That's very important to keep in mind. Okay, awesome. So Frank, I know you're on a world tour to set the record straight. So tell us what is it that you wanna set straight? <laughs> so, so, you know, I already told you about one of the big misnomers about cost segregation, right? The second and probably the more important is that not all cost segregation providers are created equal, okay? One of the biggest, um, one of the biggest problems is that the IRS never, um, never required a special license or certification to, to produce these engineering-based studies. All they did was they basically said, you have to have a background in construction and engineering principles. And oh, by the way, you have to use one of the approved IRS you know, cost estimating softwares to be able to generate these studies. So the IRS left it very loose for interpretation as to who was qualified to do these studies. And what quickly was happening in the early 2000s, because I, I don't know if you know this, but cost segregation was basically officially approved by the IRS in fall of 2004. So, so it, even though cost segregation has been around since 1987, um, the IRS never really put their stamp of approval on it until 2004. So when they did put their stamp of approval on it with no special parameters, certifications, license, you know, PE stamp, whatever, um, it became the industry became the wild, wild west because anyone and everyone who worked in the construction industry or, you know, took an engineering course in, in, in college automatically assumed that they were eligible to generate these studies. And the problem is there's a bunch of providers out there that are not properly trained or don't have the know-how as to how buildings get put together and all the elements of construction that go into these buildings that you can be taking advantage of from a cost segregation standpoint. And they're just completely missing on assets that could be segregated. So what happened was four years after, uh, actually no, just two years after the IRS released the audit technique guidelines in 2004, um, what, was, what happened was uh, the American Society of Cost Segregation Professionals was formed. And really this ASCSP, that's the acronym, ASCSP, you can look it up on Google. Um, their mission was to basically standardize the cost segregation industry and to come up with a code of ethics, standard operating procedures, training, education. They wanted to make sure that people knew how to properly put together a cost segregation study. And so to this day, um, there are only 43 individuals in the entire country that hold what's called a certified cost segregation professional designation. It's the only um, certification in the country uh, for cost segregation. So to, to, it, it's really the gold standard. There's only 43 individuals in the entire country that hold this designation and Bedford employs eight of them. So we have the lion's share of, of these professionals, but a lot of these people that we have on staff are, are professional engineers. They're PE stamped engineers. Um, they have at a minimum a four-year engineering degree. Um, so it's, there's just, so, so that's the biggest thing, Suja, is you need to know who you're using for a cost seg provider because if they don't know what they're doing or worse, they know exactly what they're doing and they're doing it on purpose by exaggerating the results because they want to make you, the client, happy. That gets you into a lot of trouble with the IRS if you're ever audited. And so you need to be very careful. You need to make sure you're working with a provider that's on the up and up. They're not going to cheat the system and exaggerate the results. They're, they're giving you what you rightfully deserve and no more. Uh, because that's what's going to keep you out of hot water with the IRS. And that's what's important, especially with 100% bonus depreciation. Um, it's such a, such a monumental change in the industry. You, you know, eventually the IRS is going to catch up with, with, from all this tax reform that's been keeping them busy. And they're going to start digging in 
to those studies that have taken advantage of 100% bonus. And you need to make sure you're working with a provider that's legitimate. So, you know, one of the things that I that I tell my clients, if, if they're going to com- competitively bid, you know, the cost seg work is just please make sure you're bidding it to firms who have the reputation, the know-how that Bedford does. And so I constantly point people, go to the American Society of Cost Segregation Professionals website. You can see who the members are, who the certified cost segregation professionals are. Make sure you're utilizing a legitimate cost segregation provider. That is a no-brainer. So so to me, that's what you have to be careful of. And if you're a passive investor, it, 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 it is your business to ask the general partner who are they using for a cost segregation provider? Because at the end of the day, if they're not doing their due diligence, they're putting you at risk as a passive investor. So you need to make sure you're educated on cost segregation and you need to make sure that your general partner um, or active investors are, are, are educated as well and they're making smart decisions on your behalf. And if it means spending a few thousand dollars more, trust me, it's worth it. So, um, you know, that's my, that's my number one, you know, kind of go-to is to educate people. We're not all created equal. There are a lot of phonies out there. Uh, I hear stories all the time about um, people who don't even visit the, the site because that's one of the ground rules for cost segregation is that you have to have somebody visit the site, take pictures, take notes. And, you know, I'm hearing stories all the time of, of you know, the people who are visiting the site um, are, are not the ones who are doing the study and the people doing the study are from overseas and, uh, or, or they're, they're, they're basically not even visiting the site at all, Suja. They're just looking at it on Google Earth and, and running a quick test. I mean, it's, there's a lot of fun and games that are played out there. You just have to make sure you protect yourself as a passive investor, active investor, it doesn't matter. So I'll, I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> well, you know, you're clearly very passionate about it. And it is really important to know who you're working with and understand any sort of compliance exposure that you might have both as a passive investor and as an active investor. So um, thank you so much, Frank. Really appreciate you coming on. Please go ahead and tell the listeners how they can get a hold of you. We'll have definitely have your contact information in the show notes. Yeah, perfect. Um, so, you know, email is always best. Uh, I will certainly, I have no problem. I'm, I'm, I'm an open phone line. So you can call me at 518-898-6603. Again, 518-898-6603. And then email is F and then my last name, G as in George, I, U, D as in David, I, C, I at bedfordteam.com. Uh, and, you know, if, if you have uh, my number one thing, Suja, is to be a resource. I want to educate people. I want to make sure that they arm themselves with the knowledge to make the right decisions. So that's my number one goal. Reach out to me, ask any question you want, and I'll make sure I, I, I steer you in the right direction. Awesome. Well, I hope you all reach out to Frank and learn more about cost seg if you have any questions or just want to talk to him. Um, thanks so much, Frank, for coming on. We'll see you next time. Thank you so much, Suja.